going on, everybody? It's B-Show Brian. Back for an official horror podcast episode. I don't know if this is going to be B-Show podcast from now on, if it's still going to be horror reanimated. I don't know. I haven't decided. But I'm back. This is Dawn of the Living Dead by White Bat Audio. You can go check out White Bat Audio on YouTube and at its website. Royalty-free music for all of your projects. Just give him some credit. I'm back. I am the Frankenstein, the Dr. Frankenstein of horror podcasting. Sometimes I slice and dice and smash some stuff together. Sometimes we cover current news and events. And sometimes I just, I'm going to talk about whatever the fuck I feel like talking about. That's the new adventure here because that's what this is. This is my show. So thank you for holding out while I was gone for a while. I'm back and uh, I appreciate you sticking around. I'm B Show Bryant. This is my world and uh, it's like an ADD caffeinated fueled, uh, caffeinated ride. Crack it open my skull of the modern day podcasting. Uh, mad scientist and see what spills out now there's been a lot of talk in recent weeks in anticipation for the follow-up to david gordon green's halloween kills entitled entitled titled halloween ends uh there's a trailer that is going to come out any day now i think jamie lee curtis mentioned july 20th which is in about six days so we will look for that and uh there's been some cool posters released, which I couldn't download and use for the thumbnail because there were some issues and blah, 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 blah. Before I forget, check out Necromaniacs podcast. Mike and Mike check out uh, and review horror movies on a weekly basis. Really good show. Good friend uh, of, of, of mine and uh, was able to hang out with Mike a little bit in New York City about almost a year ago. Very cool dude. Very cool dude. Lifelong friend. Uh, check out. Shaheen's Planet Mondo, a friend of mine, Shaheen, delves more into some of the, he's a, a media collector and also uh, likes to delve into disturbing movies. He's got the top 50 disturbing films in cinema, and I think he's through the top 20, or the bottom 20, the bottom 30. He's getting close, and he does a lot of unboxing stuff, so check him out, too. Uh, he has a review of The Monsters, which I haven't seen yet. I really want to see, but I, I wanted to record mine. And give my natural reactions uh, before I saw his. But go check him out. And I just... You should see a Munsters trailer reaction on this channel pretty soon. Uh, based on how quick I can turn around and get these edited and up. So, Break the Apocalypse podcast. I may be joining them very shortly. I may be joining them on a part-time basis going forward. But this project will be more full-time. Because I can do this whenever I want to. As opposed to trying to navigate schedules with those fine outstanding young gentlemen but go check them out anyway because i miss them dearly and uh that's that i think that's everything thanks to everybody who's who's helped us and helped keep this flame alive and who've been sending me stuff on twitter and, and, and social media i don't like to plug that all that much everything's b show brian but uh there's been a lot of people sending me things and ideas and trying to keep me going and it really has and the last couple of months are pretty tough with work as far as caseload, and for now, I'm back. So, uh, I'm glad to be back. As I mentioned, Halloween ends. Now, Halloween Kills was a very polarizing movie. Some people loved it. Some people hate it. I, when it first came out, was very excited. And I think I was blinded. I had a little smoke and mirrors type stuff happen because of the flashbacks to Halloween 1978. And I'm thinking as I, I've watched the movie again since then, once or twice. First of all, the fact that it's on HBO Max and I haven't watched it or it's on Peacock. And I haven't watched it six or seven times since it came out. That kind of woke me up to it. I probably didn't like it as much as I thought I did. Because I've watched Halloween 2, I think. Halloween 2 and 3, like two or three times since this movie came out. So I know it should be graded with a different set of standards than the other sequels but halloween kills was very polarizing and the reason i wanted to talk about this tonight halloween ends is because of some of the quotes that are starting to come out to hype this movie up uh, one from john carpenter and one from chris nelson the effects artist who designed the mask and the, the effects uh, very interesting words word choice 
And I want to get into my thoughts on Carpenter in a minute. But So word coming out is that re reshoots happened. Usually if there's extensive reshoots, it does not spell great things. If you're a Star Wars fan, you know how how bad reshoots can, you know, that news can bode for in upcoming films. Let's, t let's take The Last Jedi, for example. Or how about uh, the, the Rise of Skywalker, where they tried to cram two movies into one to try to undo everything that was done in The, the Last Jedi. So a lot of times reshoots aren't a great thing. We know that. However, not always bad. And in this case, it was reported two weeks worth of reshoots. It's not the case. It was four days, according to Christopher Nelson on the Thing With Two Heads podcast. Uh, but what I really keyed in on and people are talking about is the, the verbiage, the, the, the descriptions that are being given to this film, especially after Halloween Kills. And let me share my screen here so that you guys can see. Here we go. So, according to John Carpenter from Bloody Disgusting, this came out about a week ago. I didn't realize this came out a week ago. I must be behind. But uh, John Carpenter says, Halloween Ends is a departure from the previous movies. Now, I thought Halloween Kills was a departure. <laughs> and I think a lot of people would agree with me on that. Halloween Kills is a, a departure from the previous film. So that interests me to hear John Carpenter say it's a departure. But then I remember that recently, you know, hyping up Halloween 2018, he was saying it's the scariest Halloween sequel yet. It's the best Halloween sequel of all, right? And then I come to realize, I think John Draper from Break the Apocalypse helped me realize this. Carpenter used to be a staunch advocate for not treading on these issues and not doing sequels and it took a lot to even bring him back to the table i remember halloween h2o and doing research for uh the fractured franchise three-parter that i did for this channel so check it out it goes into the behind the scenes of all the, the films because there's a there was a never sleep again there was a um crystal lake memories there wasn't like a, a big compendium omnibus of the making of the halloween franchise and to me that was much more interesting and there was a lot more story to be told behind the scenes as far as why things were changed, why the sequels went off the rails, why the rights issues happened and different people were helming different. St it just, it to me was much more interesting, which is why I did that three part series. And thanks, thanks to the people who've checked that out. I really appreciate that. Now looking back on that, it Carpenter demanded like $10 million in back pay for money that he felt like he was received because of the success of Halloween, that he was never paid from Mustafa Akkad, Universal, whoever it was. I believe it was Mustafa, Encompass International, Trancus International. And it's been settled since. And I'm sure time heals all wounds, but uh, so does the moolah. So now you've got Carpenter along for the ride, and he's making the music, and he's shilling for the movies. And that's fine. Everyone does that. Everyone shills for the movies when they're a part of them because they want them to be successful, and that's great. It just really struck me because Carpenter was very much anti-sequel when it came to these movies. So the fact that he even came on board for 2018 was was surprising. And the fact that he's still out there just, oh, it's the best of blah, blah, blah. To me, he's saying things without really having to say a whole lot. But Departure is what stood out for me. As you can see here from Bloody Disgusting... Carpenter spoke with Sci-Fi Wire last week. And he said, you'll see it's a departure from the others. It's interesting. David is a really good director. I love working with him. With him. Um, always very close to the vest. And then Nick Castle said that Halloween Ends will end with a surprising conclusion to David Gordon Green's new trilogy. And here are the comments I was... I don't want to get into yet because there's more that he said. But uh, Chris Nelson teased that the third installment in the trilogy is weird and different. So, let's back up here. David Gordon Green has said that there's going to be a four-year time jump from the events of Halloween Kills. It's more intimate and more contained. Let's ingest all that real quick. 
So if we look at Halloween Kills, one of the things when I talked to Shaheen and John on Break the Apocalypse about when we did our review of Halloween Kills is they didn't really get what Michael is, why he couldn't be killed, why he kept coming back. And especially at the end of the movie, he's hit with a pitchfork. He's, I don't think he's hit with a car, but like baseball bats and crowbars and he's shot. He's beaten down in the streets. He picks up his mask and he just keeps going. And I laid out that things that were saying in the movie about Michael's nature, about evil, the evil of Halloween, the evil of Michael, the town being in on it. That goes all the way back to John Carpenter, which is, again, interesting given his involvement in this, which is maybe why he was more willing to jump on board. If you go back, and I have a copy, maybe I should start a Patreon and everyone who donates gets a copy of the the early, the second draft of Carpenter's Halloween 4. But in his Halloween 4 that was written by Dennis Etchison, Carpenter's idea was the town is keeping the evil alive. It was really closer to A Nightmare on Elm Street with Freddy. Like, I turn away from you, I take back all the energy I ever gave you. Same concept. Excuse me. Where the town. Man. I was getting burpy all of a sudden. Um, the town through their angst and their their penchant for, for anxiety and for downloading these fears onto their kids and pushing away everything Halloween. And we don't talk about Bruno and all that stuff. They are perpetuating the evil spirit and the negativity that surrounds Michael, and because of that, their actions, all of that psychic disturbance, that that negative juju, energy, karma, whatever you want to call it, ends up bringing back this phantom represented by, it looks like Michael Myers and acts similarly to Michael Myers, but it really is just, it's the evil that that embodied Myers, and it's through the, 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 the citizens of the town that they're bringing this forth. And it's a really cool concept. Don't know how it would have played out on screen. Very cool concept. Everyone should check it out. And I've also reviewed it with Anya Stanley, who's a Fangoria contributor on this very YouTube channel, which you can check out. But it, to me, I thought Michael in Halloween Kills was very much in line with that concept. And if you see at the end when they're all going after him and they want revenge and they're angry and they're scared and they're anxious, it just makes him stronger. And I think if you take a step back and peel the onion back, they were talking about mob mentality. And, I, and this was framed during the Trump administration and politically. And I like how they didn't try to frame and put up a Trump effigy like a Trump-like character to be a backdrop for all this because it, it would have just ruined it. I'm glad that they left it subtext in a way. But it was really about mob mentality, about how good people can be turned to do terrible things as a group. Was it Tommy Lee Jones in uh, Men in Black? People, A person is smart. People are dumb, panicky animals. On full display, blood on their hands, and perpetuating this evil that will plague them until they let it go and until they move on. And to me, that is what was happening. And Michael's evil is more than just, he's more than just a psychopath. He's more than just insane. It's almost along the lines of an HP Lovecraft type of evil. You can't understand it. You'll drive yourself crazy trying to. That's a theme in, in, some stories of the, I think it's the ancient ones or the elder ones. I'm not up on Lovecraft, so don't tar and feather me over that. But it's a similar concept. So Michael is human, but he is not. They keep it vague. And I think them perpetuating this spirit of Michael Myers, the spirit of the boogeyman, is what is happening. And when I hear intimate, I hear... That, to me, means that they're going to follow Lori or the individuals 
and how this is affecting them. More of a character sto- study and, and slow down the pace. It's not going to be this all out frenzy like it was previously. And I really honestly don't know where they go from here. I really don't. Because of two very big reasons. One, not to get away from my point because this this is what's carrying me through this point. I really want to finish out. But first, the end of the film, all the cops are there. All the sheriffs are there. Everybody's there. The whole town's there. Michael kills a shitload of people. Spoiler alert, kills Karen, Lori's daughter. But he's in the house. where He's at the crime scene. He's there. Like, is he just going to sneak out past everybody? He's going to tiptoe past the fucking lynch mob? Whatever's left in the cops? He let himself be captured before when he faced the cops. They showed that in 78. So what are they going to do? Do they capture him and take him back to prison? And then Lori and the family tries to sneak into Smith's Grove or hell, maybe everyone and see this. Maybe this is my Arkham. Maybe I'm going to get my Arkham story, my Smith's Grove story that I pitched a couple years ago where maybe, you know, Lori and her granddaughter and, and everyone surrounding that they've got blood on their hands and uh, the authorities blame them. And they're to contain this, this evil and this contagion. They lock everybody up in Smith's Grove. Guess who else is there? Michael. And then you have a story contained in Smith's Grove told through the, the psychiatrist interviewing the family and the survivors and then them coming face-to-face with Michael on a final confrontation. Um, maybe I'm going to get that. I don't know. That's not my pitch, but I'm, you know what I mean? I'm the mad scientist. That's what I do. I'm bringing these two things together. However, how do you go from Michael is there and he's just going to disappear like a fart in the wind or they capture him. It was going to escape again. He's already escaped maximum security. Now he's going to escape again. In the real world, you know what I do with Michael Myers? I do one of two things. I would bury him in the ground and concrete him in. Or I would have him executed by having his arms and legs and head chopped off and buried in different places from his torso. Because how else are you going to stop it? So where are they going to go from Halloween Kills? And it's going to be years later. So what's he going to do? Just drift back in? They're all still living with this fear. Is he really dead? See, I had a theory. Because we're talking about the evil of Michael. The sins of the society and perpetuating this evil. I had a thought where the ending makes sense symbolically. Not Literally. And this is the problem with continued sequels that follow this vein. And this is the the original point I wanted to get back to. So thanks for sticking with me as I meandered through it. But the end of the film, Michael is killed. He's down. He's dead. Seemingly. Then he gets back up and they go to continue attacking and he kills all these people. And then Karen dies. Right. So to me, if you take that back to a thematic, symbolic type of act, maybe Michael's not alive, but the symbolic idea is because the citizens are perpetuating what's going on, he's turned them into monsters, he's turned them into People that do terrible things. He's turned them into evil creatures, right? Uh, the the dark. What would Sam Loomis say? Uh, Sam Hain isn't the devil or witches or goblins or ghosts. It's the unconscious mind. We're all afraid of the dark within ourselves. Can't believe I pulled that quote right out of my ass, but I did. Nicely done, B Show. But I I could see them saying Michael died, and that ending was symbolic or it was not necessarily that he lived and killed those people but because of their actions because of their sinful ways that they're perpetuating evil so people in the community are going to continue to die and that's and that's the way you symbolically reference that if the sub if if the if this is a one-off movie which this is the issue with continued sequels with this franchise if this was a one-off movie 
and they ask David Gordon Green, why did Michael, he was dead, why did he, seemingly dead, why did he get back up and kill the, the people? He could honestly say, you could argue that Michael wasn't alive, but it's symbolic that these people, through their vengeance and their bloodlust and their quest for revenge, are perpetuating the very evil. The the other prisoner that died, because he, he jumped out a window because they are chasing him. These things line up symbolically. It's not Michael. It's the spirit of this evil entity that could overtake any one of us. Symbolically, the people are causing their own demise and the demise of their loved ones and the, devi- the, the, the demise of their fellow citizens by perpetuating this evil, right? I could see that if it was a standalone movie. But John Draper made a good point when I was talking about this spirit of the boogeyman type of thing. I think it was his quote was something like, yeah, but B, this is like 40 years in. You're past the point of abstract. And that was a really good point because I'm a fan of the abstract not necessarily fully fleshed out explained. Letting it marinate in people's minds let you come up with your own opinion i love that i love that because i i tend to be very literal a little too literal and i i i understand how you can make someone uncomfortable and keep them on the seat of their pants by not fully explaining things and to me there are a lot of like john carpenter's original halloween the thing to me that's when carpenter's at his best is when things aren't clearly defined. They're a little fuzzy and they make you they mess with your head. Because now it's not just a a, a narrative film. It's a mind fuck. If you go back and watch Halloween, I'll do a video on this, show Halloween and the thing and how this is true. Those movies are mind fucks. Because they give you just enough information to follow along and think you know. But they leave out just enough so that you really don't know what's completely going on. You can't really define everything. And I like that concept, but now when it, and it doesn't matter that you've taken a, a, a an eraser and wiped the slate clean from 1978 on. And now this is you know this is one night and this is one night. It's the evil of Michael. It's undefined. You've been doing this for 45 years. Now you're at the point where you can't keep it abstract. When you stretch it out movie after movie after movie, like John said, people are going to start going, yo, what the fuck's going on? you got to explain it at some point. That is the issue with this franchise in general, is it was started with an abstract exercise, and the farther along they went, they had to define. And the more defined lines and harsher edges you draw around Michael Myers, he loses that that essence that makes him special. When you define the undefinable, it loses its luster. And you could get away with that in 1978 or uh, in, in Halloween 2018 as a sequel to 78 because it's still within the same vein. They're talking about this as if it's a trilogy. This is the fourth movie coming up in this particular series, in this, this plot line. 78, 2018, Halloween Kills, Halloween Ends. Four movies, four movies, not three. And I know 2018 was really a soft reset and a reboot, and they're going to ignore Halloween 78 as far as their storytelling is concerned. But to John's point, it was a really good point that I didn't see because I was being self-indulgent. I liked them going in this abstract direction. I liked Halloween Kills more than the average moviegoer because of that. And because of the flashbacks, let's be honest. But you can't stretch it out for three or four or five movies and and have fuzzy bound boundary lines. You have to define it at some point. Or else what the hell are you watching? Like Jason, they could easily in Friday the thirteenth, they could easily have have not explained why uh, Pamela Voorhees was the killer. She's just killing everyone. She used to work here. No one knows why she did what she did. She's just crazy. Woo. And they could easily have left it abstract. But from the first movie, they're like, my kid drowned and these kids were fucking and they weren't paying attention. And this is not going to happen to anybody else. 
It made her such an interesting and dynamic character because her intent was good, but she was batshit crazy. And the way she tried to prevent that shit from happening was evil. Clearly defined. So that's where I'm at with this. I really am not sure where this is going to go. They say it's a departure, but they were already starting. The, the horse had already left the barn in the last movie. Now, are they just trying to create intrigue? I don't know. Possibly. Hype? I don't know. Now, I was going to pull up uh, the interview with Sean Clark. Is, is there anybody that has a cooler job, if you're a horror fan, than Sean Clark? Super agent to all the horror movie people, convention all-stars. He makes documentaries. He's friends with all these guys. Fuck. Super cool. Seems like a super cool dude. I mean, that's that's the life. I think that's what, that's what we all strive for. He just had the balls and the wherewithal and the, the, the agency to act on it and make it a reality, but. On his podcast with, with Chris Nelson, the horror effects expert, yeah, he was saying, uh, you go check out the thing with two heads. He said, I'm excited for people to see the movie. I think it's weird, it's different, and I like that. So that's that's another thing, too, is they're at the point where they could really do anything now, and this movie's going to probably do well. And I'm going to do a separate... Like, not what I would have done with Halloween Kills, but like Halloween Kills, Halloween Ends, and some of my thoughts on that. This is more for just the, the current news coming out about it. Until we see the trailer next week. Um, you know, a, a departure isn't a bad thing, but they're running into that terror, that Halloween 3 territory. Where they want to be a departure. And see, that's what I meant about Carpenter being so against sequels. And telling the same story and retreading back in the day. So much so that they didn't want to make two. And then they deliberately killed off Michael and Loomis. So that they wouldn't have to make a three. And then when they were forced to make three through litigation. Well, not litigation. Sorry. Two was litigation. Uh, it's in the Fractured franchise. Uh, they said, we'll only do three if we're producers. We're not directing. And it's going to be completely different as an anthology. And now here they are, fourth movie. So this is this is Halloween 4. This is Carpenter's Halloween 4. How poetic that this is his Halloween 4. And uh, it may be venturing into that ethereal territory. I feel like Macho Man when I do that. Oh, yeah. yeah the, the shape, Michael Myers. Yeah. Funky man, he comes in, he goes out. He's like a ghost. Is he a man? Nobody really knows. A little late for me to be doing that. I'm going to be waking people up. Uh, but honestly, where do you go from here? Weird and funky. What's weird? You know, they had the opportunity to go weird with the original, you know, Halloween 2018. They had the knife at the end and, uh, what's her fucking name? Lori's granddaughter. Grandmother. Grandmother. I call her Little Red Riding Hood because she's always like, grandmother. Hello, grandmother. Can you just get over it, Grandmother. Like an 18 year old girl calling her grandma grandmother. Uh, anyway, she had the knife at the end of the movie, clutching it in the truck, and it was to me that was like your your Tommy Jarvis moment at the end of uh, of Friday the Thirteenth Part Five when when what's her name? I can't, it's too late. I can't. I'm I'm trying. I got to stay within one franchise here. I'm trying to recall these names. Pam. She comes into the. Uh, she comes into the hospital bed and he's behind the door with the knife. That's what I thought was going to happen. I thought uh, Andy Matichek, whatever her name is, Lori's granddaughter. Why can I not think of that? It's one of the main characters. You know, I'm going to cheat, guys. I'm going to cheat. It's just... Yeah, I'm not going to find it. I'm not going to waste your time because you're listening. And I appreciate that. And I'm watching. But they had an opportunity to do something interesting there because, and I'm not going to get too far into it now, but they could have done the Jamie Lloyd thing where 
She was kept from her grandmother. She understands her grandmother. She's pissed at her mom because there was friction there. But they didn't do it. And then they had an opportunity in Halloween Kills for Lori to get her out of the fucking way. And this is, I might, I might do this later on because I know I'm running over a little bit. I wanted to keep this about a half hour, but I just, I wish we could get past the goddamn Lori Strode thing. Really? And then to make all of this more complicated, the cherry on top, we've talked about ethereal. We've talked about different, a departure, a weird, which is fine. And as I mentioned with Halloween three, let me finish that thought. They're running the risk now where if they don't keep it somewhat similar and defined, harshly defined, then they could with this last movie in this series, piss a lot of general movie audience goers off. Because if they, if they, I'm sorry, if they keep it sharply defined, it's not going to be a great film in taking artistic chances. It's going to be a little bit pedestrian. If they go crazy, there's going to be a lot of people that aren't going to get it. So, that, I apologize for bungling that, but that's what I originally was trying to say. Um, and the cherry on top of that is, if you look at comments from, I think it was David Gordon Green or Jason Blum, one of them has said, maybe Jason Blum, that he's open to more Halloween movies in the future. So, is Lori going to die? Is someone else going to take up the mantle? And in the vein, in the vein of modern film, trying to bring females into the cinema and into these fan bases, is there still a chance that Lori's granddaughter takes up the mantle. Now that would be interesting. I don't think it would get over. I think it would piss a lot of people off. And I don't see her as a strong character to be... <laughs> you know, walking around in a female Michael Myers mask. Someone made one of these. I'm trying to find the picture. Here we go. <laughs> Here, let me share this for you. This is terrible. Uh, here we go. Yeah, I don't see this, man. And I really don't know where they go from here. I know they're talking about weird and they're talking about departures. Um, but where do you go? There's gonna, there's going to be a bunch of people who aren't going to be willing to go with you as far as the ethereal abstract and there's going to be people that are going to be upset that it's just the same old shit i mean here's the other thing okay big thing god i sound like bill maher okay michael couldn't be killed by the gunshots the pitchforks all the stuff and there's no real explanation as to why other than the more we attack when the stronger he gets so how the fuck are you going to kill him you're going to chart a course with the new space telescope and shoot him into the fucking sun of a nearby galaxy? Didn't work so well for Jason X. Whoa, wait a minute. This is actually kind of creepy. This is some tourist trappy shit. This just caught my attention. Our, oh my God. This, I may have just completely did a 10, a, a, a a 180 on my stance of the female Michael Myers. Look at this shit. Let me... Uh... Bloody Disgusting, for those of you listening, published in 2016, <clears throat> says Don Post once made a female Michael Myers mask? So Okay, so this is actually... I thought this was a, a custom by someone in the community. Holy shit. What you may not know is long before sexy Michael Myers costumes became a thing, Don Post turned their Myers mask into something special. In 2001, Don Post, for whatever reason, this is again bloody disgusting, John Squires. I follow him on Twitter. He seems like a decent guy. Uh, back in 2001, for whatever reason, they came up with the idea of making a female Michael Myers mask, which they dubbed the She-Mask. 
The few fans that actually know about the oddball offering tend to refer to it as the Mike, the Michelle Myers mask. They added long hair to the iconic mask, which could be worn down or in a ponytail. They also painted the pink lipstick. Okay, that's where that came from. That is some creepy Texas Chainsaw tourist trap looking shit. It's almost impossible to come by, but those who've actually seen the still unreleased 2007 movie Poughkeepsie Tapes may recognize it. Wow, okay. The killer in the film wears that mask in Poughkeepsie Tapes. Wow. Jesus, that is unsettling. Okay, so Javina's masking site. Oh, it's no more. Oh, man, they took it down. At least I got to save these pictures in case this article goes away. This is creepy shit. Oh, my God. Could you imagine? All right. I, I eat my words here. I got to eat my words. Look at this one in particular. The top one's one thing. The bottom one is just creepy. Let me see if I can enlarge this real quick. Bear with me, guys. Look at that. My God. For those of you who, who can't see it, it is a, I'll put a link in the description. Wow, that is some tourist trap looking shit. There we go. Even that one. That one looks like Texas Chainsaw 2022. The, I got to be honest with you. Those are probably scarier than the original shape mask. Oh, my God. And I'll tell you why. There's a video that I have on here. I'll try to pull it up. There's a video that I saved on... My YouTube channel, for those of you still hanging out, I appreciate it. Someone had a, a Don Post uh, Shatner, a Kirk mask that was unconverted. I think they they cut out the eye holes and made it. They, they did everything but paint it. And it looks really unsettling. At least if I can find my video of it. Masks, masks, masks. Here it is. All right, let's see. So let me share here. Check this out. Yeah, I guess they didn't cut out the eye holes. But to me, that looks more unsettling. Because it looks even more like a human, like an emotionless human face. And there's a couple shots in this where it just it looks kind of goofy. But like right here. It's, oh, it's blurry. It's hard to see. Yeah, because like it looks like a real person, but it's not. It's it's that uncanny valley type of thing. I wish I knew who this was so I can give him credit, but where's the, the phone? Here we go. It's just this weird uncanny valley type of reaction when I look at it. It's like it looks like a legit human face, but it's really not. Yeah, the shape lurks. I don't know if that's really who did it originally. It was someone from the mask-making community. If someone could could uh, clear that up, I'd appreciate it. But my God, is that not unsettling? <laughs> oh, my God. So, yeah, I take that back. The, the – oh, here it is again. These two shots are two of the most unsettling Myers masks I've ever seen. And apparently, those were Don Post creations. That one right there. Oh, my God. It looks like Leatherface. So, yeah, if they if they went this route, oh, my God. If 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 uh, Andy Matichik's character, if she skins Laurie Strode's face and wears it as the next shape mask, I will retract everything I said. If she goes that route and then off to the races and she's the next Michael Myers. Michelle Myers. Holy shit. God, I'm not going to sleep right tonight looking at that. Like, 
God, I, I just keep back, coming back to it, guys. It's bloody disgusting. Don Post made female Michael Myers mask. Just search that in Google. Like, here, look at this. This this part right here, if I can move my screen. Just the side shot. Like, the one staring at you is, like, bad enough. This one here, the side shot, and, like, the it looks like an old house. Uh, I don't. I want to know who took those pictures because that's pretty... It's pretty dope, man. Great job. <laughs> Nightmare fuel for sure. Oh, all right. I don't know where I left off, but I think I made my goddamn point. Um, interesting things coming out of the production of Halloween ends. We're not sure how it's going to. I don't think Halloween itself is going to end. I think these titles are just, I mean, they can't go with the Pink Panther Returns, Revenge, and uh, Curse. Those have been done, obviously. But interesting for sure all right i'm out of here i have an appointment in like seven hours i gotta go get some sleep my name is b show brian i'm back i will be back next week with more uh and i'm not sure what we're going to talk about so it'll be interesting stay tuned uh watch you the youtube for the video version of the podcast and also b i'll be putting up the audio versions shortly but uh thanks i will see you next time sleep well <laughs>